Hey, welcome back to Structure Fishing. I'm Jim Shell. I've got some, while I was digging through my old video collection, Finding Lost Tapes that I uploaded, I came across some video that I had of Buck Perry giving a basic seminar. Uh, and it's always great to hear Buck Perry's voice. A lot of you, uh, you know, newer guys uh, really never had the opportunity to hear Buck Perry. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure you guys are really going to enjoy this. I'm going to have a five-part series with Buck. The first part you're going to see right now, Buck is going to talk about the basic movements of fish. And then uh, the following weeks I'll have part two, which Buck will talk about uh, weather and water. Part three will be uh, controls. Uh, part four will be presentation of lures. And part five will be structure. And like I say, it, it's just a thrill to hear Buck's voice again. And, uh, you know, hear it right, right from the man himself talk about all these things. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, Buck Perry series here, and we're going to start with uh, the first part, basic movements of fish. It's a fishing fact that some time or another a fish can be caught most any, by anyone, most any place, on most anything, and by most any method. Now another fishing fact is this, if you and I expect to catch more and, and bigger fish, we must spend our time where we have the best chance to catch fish. A fishing guideline. If you and I expect to catch more and bigger fish consistently, we must be at the right place at the right time, fishing in the right manner. Spoon plugging. One of the first questions that people ask you is, what does this word spoon plugging mean? This is a word that, uh, that I coined many, many years ago. And because I figured that my, our method of fishing and our education and our in, know what uh, uh, all about should have a specific word, so I call it spoon plugging. Uh, all of us know that lures and things are called spoons, and a lot of them said, let's go spooning, but my daddy always said, let's go plugging. So this is where that, that this originated, way back before, uh, before, really, before World War II. Now here's what I say is spoon plugging. What makes a fish tick? You and I must know what makes a fish tick. Then, how do I catch him? Now that's one thing. Now another version of what spoon plugging would be, would be, uh, if you and I want to catch fish consistently, we must be at the right place, at the right time, fishing in the right manner. Now, I could even go a little bit farther and say, if you and I want to consistently catch fish, we must, uh, let me be sure I get this right, we must spend our time where we have the best chance to catch a fish. If, uh, we're going to have to have some guidelines, and so, uh, so we're going to talk about the bass. Now, the reason that we use the bass is for the simple reason that he is a universal fish. He's everywhere. Now the next thing is that I use the bass because he reacts to weather and water conditions in such a way that uh, uh, he, he, he is a little bit worse, you might say, than any fish on, the, on that group there. Now we don't worry about the other species. If we and you and I consist to learn how to catch fish, uh, the bass, we don't worry about the others. If they happen to get it in the way, it's just their bad luck. So the bass is what we're after. Now the main thing that you and I try to do, and that Spoon Flower tries to do, is go after the big ones. Now the, most of you tournament fishermen and other people, they are fishing where they usually catch the small fish. The people that catch the big fish are the Spoon Pluggers, because we, we actually go after the, the big fish. And you'll see why we do this in just a few minutes. Now in this lake, we look at this lake and we walk out to it and I look out across there, I know exactly where the fish are. Now when I say that, people kind of giggle a little bit. You know, they, they kind of eyeball and, uh, and they say, well, they, I don't believe that, that I can look out that lake and I know where they are. The reason I do that, because the fish in that lake or any other lake are either in this way. They're either in the shallows in the deep or somewhere between. 
Now, when I say that or you say that, they're going to giggle. They're going to laugh. They're going to think this is kind of funny. But it isn't, because that's the way it is. The fish in that lake right there, or any lake or any water, are either in the shallows, in the deep, or somewhere between. Slide. In our work and in our guidelines that we use in, in spoon plugging is that we break up the water into two sections, the shallow water and the deep water. Now, the shallow water, our guideline is that any water shallower than eight to 10 feet, we consider the shallows. Any water that's deeper than that, we consider deep water. That could be on the, on the left-hand side or it could be on the right-hand side. At the shallows, down to eight to 10 feet in depth. The deep waters from there on downstairs. Now this is where we come to the most important thing and it's a point that you and I must get across, Terry. Where is the home of the fish? This is where the spoon plugger is different from anybody else because he, he has found out where the home of the fish is. The home of the fish, slide, the home of the fish is deep water. If you and I do not accept this at this point in time, if we don't accept that, that the home of the water where the fish spend a greater part of their time is somewhere in the deep water, we might as well stop right here. Because if your students or anybody doesn't accept the fact that, that the deep water is the home of the fish, where the fish spend a major part of his time, and is the only escape or sanctuary from an hostile environment. He can't go up in the shallow and hide behind a tree or something of that nature. He has to go to deeper water. Now, if you ask me where, to, if, where I am likely to find this fish, I only have one particular thing that I say. I say where things are more stable. And the deeper you go in the home area, in the deep water, the more stable conditions become. That's temperature, the light, the pressure, everything uh, that the fish uh, is exposed to in, uh, in, in, in his environment. So the, you say, uh, well, uh, how deep is it? Well, in reservoirs, it's the channel. In, nine, in other words, it's just uh, you, your interpretation is the fact that the deep water, the home of the fish, are the channels. In natural lakes or where there's holes, it's in the deeper holes and slots. That's very easy to remember. That's very, that your interpretation of where the fish spend a greater part of time is either in that channel or in those holes or slots. You might ask this question at this point, slide, where, what is the sanctuary depth? That, what are the sanctuary, where are they likely to be? Where is the sanctuary depth? Now, the average uh, weather conditions that you and I face with in water conditions over the country would be that the fish will always take 20 feet or better if the depth is available. Now I'm going to say that again. If 20 feet depth is available, the sanctuary depth, our guideline would be that the fish always go, go below or past the 20 feet if the depth is available. Now if the depth is available below that, the average uh, condition where things are very stable for the fish, and it would be an average uh, sanctuary depth in normal conditions would be 30 to 35 feet. There's two important depths here that we, you and I have to remember. One of them is eight to 10 feet, which separates the shallows from the deep. The, the other one is 30 to 35 feet. Now that doesn't, that's it, that's the average under, under average conditions. Waters are pretty, become pretty stable at that point but they're not always that unstable. So later on, we're gonna find out that it could be deeper than that. 
Good, and uh, so we'll talk about that just a little bit later. I could cover it at this point by saying that some, if they're under certain uh, conditions, uh, they're going to go uh, just as deep as they can in a lot of uh, reservoirs and a lot of bodies of water. Now, the, they could be the 60, 70, 80 feet. In my older age, I've begun to, to say two things. Under normal conditions, if I haven't fished the 30 or 35 feet, I haven't fished an area. Now, let me say that again. If I have the waters available and I'm fishing an area, a structure situation of fishing a body of water, and I haven't covered to 30 to 35 feet, I haven't fished the area. Now, as I get older, to get after the big fish, such as the big walleye and the big northern and the big and the huge bass and uh, the musk musky, I go down even farther than that. I may have to, I, I would place it down as far as 60 feet. The, one of the biggest strings of bass I ever caught was, was at 70 feet, and I got a lot of them on the ever cast. The deepest I ever caught a fish, a uh, bass, was 125 feet. I only got one, but I got one, and he was, uh, he was 125 feet in Lake B. So, but ordinarily, the, the sanctuary depth where things become pretty stable is 30, 35 feet. Sanctuary depth is normally this way. The fish are so deep and so dormant, they're almost impossible to find and catch. Now they may become active and you may, you and I may be very good downstairs and we hit them in the sanctuary depth when they're active and not migrating anything of us sitting down there, but they are active and probably feeding a little bit. Uh, but this is uncertain. Uh, you and I as a fisherman, our guideline says, well, I'm gonna have trouble catching the fish in the sanctuary depth. I can go downstairs and maybe I can, but I'm gonna have trouble. So the question arises in all of our minds, how are we gonna catch him if that's the case? Now we're say for uh, two reasons. One is the fact that these fish do not stay so deep or so dormant all the time. The second reason that you and I are saved is the fact that when these fish become active, they move toward the shallows. May. What? May move toward the shallows. Yeah, I said may, and I should say may move toward the shallows. Now we're saved again because when they fish move toward the shallows, migrate toward the shallows, they do not go in just any direction. They don't decide today to go off to the east toward the shallows, the bar go to the west or the south or north or cut across through some trees or things like that. They'll use features of the bottom which we call structure breaks and break lines, which we call a structure situation. These are features of the bottom that are different from the surrounding area. These features which are different from the surrounding area extend from the, must extend from the deep water to the shallows so that the fish can immediately make access and the path that he takes will lead him to shallow water. The most common structure is a bar, such as you see there. This is a ridge-like feature. It could be flat along the side, but if a fish was in that area, he could see this bar extending out through there, ridge-like bar. That's one of the most common structures. Now I might say, you might say to Eric at this time that this is the, he will m m do the movements and what we're gonna talk about later on all the features or different types of structures that we will ever run across. This is the most common one right here. We don't, will not in this lecture talk about all the different types of structures. But uh, they, if uh, in round figures, they take the whole world and all types of water conditions and everything, there's only about 17 of them. And some lakes will have one, such as this bar. Some will have two or three. 
does hardly any of them have all 17. But uh, they, they, uh, the natural lakes have the least different ones, whereas the reservoirs have quite a few different uh, uh, structure situations that the fish use in their movements and migration toward the shallow. This is subject matter that we will cover in, in, in schools and things like that and in our, uh, in our basic book and also in a home study course. But this is the most common structure situation that will exist. This is a rocky bar. Slide. This is a long, slim bar that's going out and going off into deep water and goes on out through yonder and goes to the channel. There's all types of them, but you can read it. Now, when the fish become active and move toward the shallows, they will come to this to this uh, structure situation. Regardless where they might be sitting in the channel or in the hole, they will move toward the structure situation. The little fish will be ahead of them, and they will uh, move. Now, a lot of people say, well, I noticed that you had uh, a whole bunch of fish. This is something that, uh, that here's my guideline, starting at two, about two and a half pounds and going on up. As the fish become older and bigger, the tighter is school downstairs. That's my guideline. And so this could be a school of, uh, let's say, bass, the little ones, we don't, we're after the big fish. The little ones are on ahead of those as they move on up there because the little ones says, if he gets to the shallows, he's pretty safe because you're going to find this out in just a few minutes. So he'll move to the structure and start moving. Our basic guideline, as we'll find a little bit later, is how far this fish moves on this structure is controlled by the weather and water conditions. How far he goes, how long he stays, is controlled by the weather and the water conditions at that particular time of the movement. So here we have it there. So let's improve this, the pretty good. Let's don't mess around here uh, and have a halfway good movement. Let's just take it on up. We're going to have a good movement. He moves up a while and it's still good. And he moves on up until he gets just about perfect and he slides and he moves on up, the group will move up to around eight to 10 feet. The little ones have moved on ahead into the shallows. It's at this point that the big fish says, uh, from two and a half pounds on up, two and a half pound group, say, and a three pound group, and a four pound group, and a five to five and three kind of, uh, it's a five to three, five and three quarter pound group. I've been able to find those groups of fish up to five and three quarter pounds all over the United States. If it's any big ones, which will be a few, will be located with this big, this, this group, the big fish. It could be two or three big ones. Another guideline that I have is this. Anything above six pounds is a freak in my book. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not bigger fish up there, but don't you expect to go out and find a school of all of them the six pounders. Uh, don't expect to find uh, um, many freaks. Don't expect to go out and catch, I'm going to catch my limit eight pounders today or 10 pounders or 20 pounders. Whatever happens to be, because these fish are, are, uh, they are, they are really, let's put it this way, uh, that big group of big fish, I'm run another slide, the, this, this group of fish, it got to the eight to 10 feet, and they said, whoa, back up, I'm getting too shallow. The little fish have gone on in. Now, how long they stay in this position is dependent upon the weather and the water conditions. Very important that you remember this. This movement, it, anywhere on this, is in minutes rather than hours. It can happen once to twice a day. In the hot summer time, it could move and it could be two times, in the early in the morning and late in the afternoon. In the winter time, probably a cold weather, it'd be just one movement. 
and this will normally occur in the center of the day. But winter or summer, one thing you keep, we always keep in mind, we can't put words in a fish's mouth. I just gave you a, a basic guideline there that in the, in the summertime, they, uh, uh, they are hotter weather, they may st go shallower. I mean, they may stay there longer than they would in the wintertime. But anyway, uh, instead of one time or two times, the main thing that I keep, and this is the guideline, if you go out and do not hit a fish before 10 o'clock, in other words, you fish and fish and fish and you do not catch a fish early in the morning, winter or summer, you do not leave the water between 10 and 2. One of your basic guidelines, you're going to find out that when a lot of people, when they're sitting in, a, in the shade at, in noon, having a fiesta or a siesta, that's when the fish move. So the guideline is this, if you go out early and don't catch a fish, then do not leave the water between 10 and 2. The other guideline I gave you that in a colder part of the season you normally have one movement and it occur normally in sometime between 10 and 2 o'clock. In the hotter part of the season then you may have two. You have one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Guideline, but if you don't hit them in the morning during that hot, hotter period, do not leave the water between 10 and 2. That's a pretty good guideline that you and I go. And if we do this, nine times out of ten, you, you, you're going to hit the fish if a movement occurs. We don't know how it's going to occur. It could occur way down yonder downstairs, but a little later on you're going to find out where you're going to find out where they're going to move and where they're going to stop. Shows a hot spot. So the, the audio that you do with this is that when the fish move up to the 8 to 10 feet and the smaller fish scatter into the shallows, that's a, a full movement. Now this is when the fish are biting so-called. This is when the shoreline fisherman catches fish. But in 9 times out of 10 he's going to catch small fish. So this is known as a hot spot. Now the reason for it's a hot spot is not due to the weed that might be in there, a brush pile or some stumps or a pile of rocks or some kind of a bush in the water that he's casting toward. And it's, it's not a hot spot due to that. Those things, those are breaks that we're talking about in a few minutes, breaks on the bottom. Uh, they, it's a hot spot for simply the, due to the fact that the migration route that the fish take in their movements toward the shallow just happen to lead to that spot. That's the reason it's a hot spot. For no other reason. And it goes back downstairs. It goes back into the sanctuary depths. Now I'll repeat again. This how long he go, how far he goes, and how long he stays is controlled by the weather and water conditions. This movement that occurs toward the shallows or into the shallows is in minutes rather than hours. Sometimes it may be over. The total thing could be over in 15 minutes. That means you got to know enough that you, uh, so that you make a good catch in 15 minutes when you locate them. It could be that it, in under certain conditions it could last an hour. But I, in 40 years of fishing I've never seen it last an hour. It's uh, usually the, about the longest I ever saw one, that, and I was in the fish was about 40 minutes. You 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 have to talk about at times uh, how the weeds makes your interpretation to the type of structure that is there. You uh, you and the reason it's very important because you find some guys that's in the weeds, they can't read the shoreline, they can't read the weeds. But it's very important that you get the story across. And so, with let's look at some uh, something that we can talk about. You can you can point out the fact that the weed line in this in this case they say they say is go down 10 feet. 
Now, if the weed line goes down 10 feet, if you look at that carefully, with the weed line in relationship to the shoreline, it can just about show you the shape of the bottom. How deep it falls off, how flat it falls off, and the whole ball of wax. So the weed line is very important in a way in your interpretation. The next thing about the weed line is, is very important is how the fish use it, how a presentation of lures occur. So there's the weed line, a cross section showing the weed line. Now this this uh, moves some fish from the sanctuary depths into the uh, into slide into that toward that weed. Let's say the weather the begin to the weather's pretty good and so the fish are gonna move and they're gonna move pretty shallow. We're going to talk about weather in just a little bit, so you'll un not, uh, don't ask the question at this time. We're going to cover that. So they're going to move toward the, we the shallows, and so they move all the way to the, to the weed line. Some small fish are going into the weeds, but don't expect too many of the big fish at this stage of the game. Where they're sitting there is the base break line of the weed line. This is, uh, this is very important in your presentation alerts to keep this in mind, that the fish move up there, and that they may move along the outer edge of the boat. Now, if there's no fish on the outside, you don't figure that there's only any on the inside. You do not stop and start throwing back in there and fishing blind in that weed line. You figure that the when they come up there, the mass of them are going to be on the outside. The little ones may be back in there, the little stinkers or the tournament bass, but the, the big, big bass are going to be on the outside, and they're going to move along the edge of the base of the brake line, of the brake line, the weed line, which is a brake line, the base. Here again, how long they stay and how long they're going to be there is controlled by the weather and the water conditions that before they go back downstairs. Now, that is, the reason it's a hot spot again, the weed line is not, the weed point in the weeds is not why it's a hot spot, the weeds. It's due to the fact that the migration route the fish took just happened to lead there. In this case, you can see it's a, it's a ridge-like bar. So regardless of which uh, type of situation, we're giving you basic movements of the fish, the basic guidelines that you and I follow, and something we always keep in mind. Slide. This is uh, more of that about the weeds and the presentation of floors. As you get it later on, and you're gonna find a crooked weed line, and you're gonna follow a crooked weed line on the troll, on the cast, you're gonna find all these little, little hickeys sticking out. You're going to have all the little bays in the weed line, or even a crooked line, uh, 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 shoreline with no weeds. All the little points along there is if you don't find them on the points, they're not going to be back in those little bays. So the same thing with the weeds. If you don't find them on the outside of the weeds, you're not necessarily going to find them on the inside of the weeds. Now, here is where the mass of the, in this slide, is a, uh, a lake is completely covered with weeds, all kinds. Could even be pads, but weeds. And when the fish are back in the weeds, you, you don't, you're, you're fishing blind. And most likely you couldn't get the lure to them. And most likely the fish are so dormant back on those weeds that you couldn't catch them anyway. But here's the key. When these fish become active, they'll move to the outside. Now you see where we're, what, what's occurring here? They're on the outside. They're on the outside. You and I can fish it. We can control our fishing in these instances. And that's the most important thing that we, that we have before us is so that we uh, know what to do to catch fish. The basic, now it, home of the fish is deep water. You saw how the fish occurred. Once or twice on a normal fishing day, these fish will begin to move, may move toward the shallows. 
how far they go and how long they stay is dependent upon the weather and the water conditions. When the fish move toward the shallows, they do not go just in any direction, but along well-established paths are features of the bottom, which we call structure breaks and break lines, a structure situation. They use this migration route to move to the shallows. How far they go, how long they stay, is controlled by the weather and the water conditions at that particular time. That's the basic movements of the fish. This is what you must accept. Most of people, when they get, see a great big body of water, it scares them to death. They look out there at that big rascal and they say, where in the world do I start? Where in the world are the fish going to be? But I'd, here as a spoon plucker, with a little experience and a little study, pretty soon you you are not scared of any of them. You're like me. My biggest joy in fishing today is fish one that I haven't fished before. And there's very few, to be frank, there's very few of them left in the United States. But they're all alike. We just got through showing you the basic movements of the fish in that lake in structure situations. Later on, we're going to, we're going to teach you uh, ever ever struck the situations in that body of water, and every one, we're, at times we're going to come down to the point where we're going to show you all 17 of them. And you may never run into more than two or three of them in your lifetime. But that lake is, uh, is not a secret. It should not be scared. The only thing that's scary out there is what probably water skiers who's going to cut your line off. So here about from a seasonal standpoint. In the colder part of the season, the migrations are going to be uh, short. They're going to take up the, the steep stuff side of your structure, situa uh, your features in your lake or reservoir. They are not going to get too far from the deep water, and they're going to have real fast access to the deep water or the sanctuary depths. Now, as a, he's a cold-blooded creature, you've got to keep this in mind. The weather conditions are fairly bad in that time, cold front after cold front. But the, the activity of the fish is quite slowed down because he's cold-blooded. His metabolism slows. But as the water warms up and get into the hottest part of the season, then his movements are in the warmer after spawning, uh, you usually say, uh, then it's the warmer sea, he'd take the long routes. Uh, and this is uh, where you and I will separate the, 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 the seasonal standpoint. And I look at it this way. The seasonal view slide. The seasonal view of movement and migration, distance and time. How far and time, how long. Hand rule or guideline, your and my guideline. In the colder part of the season, the distance and time is going to be short. In the harder part of the time, the distance and time is going to be longer. This gives you a pretty accurate thing to look at from a seasonal standpoint. Let's look at another thing. Here is the view of a structure situation. One of the st structure situations is a steep bank. Of course, you know what the bar is. So you're looking at the colder part of the season, uh, say in the winter cold, you've got a steep access over there to the left, and the fish have immediate access to deep water. Then, as they approach the spawning season, they have a cove that they could move into for spawning purposes. Then, as the spawning season is over, then they got the long bar, which is to the right. You got the whole seasonal pattern right there. So, you, you definitely want to keep those things, that thing in mind right there. Slide. Very important points that I kind of keep in mind is I've, uh, you and I must remember these things. 
the deep water is a home of the fish. Periodically, they become active and may move toward shallows. Three, in movement not haphazard, but on paths or migration routes. The routes are on structure, and on structure situations, which in a structure situation means structure breaks and break lines. You'll get all this as you advance in your study and read your, uh, study your material. No structure, no fish. So if you're out fishing on a great big flat, don't expect to catch any fish. When moving, they pause or stop at breaks on structure. Now the reason for this is, is fortunately, the fish can see these breaks. And the breaks on structure are, are, could be a stump, it could be a sunken boat, it could be weeds, it could be stumps, it could be, uh, it could, uh, be most anything. It could be a bush, uh, it could be a little gully or a wash. It could be a lot of things that's on there that, uh, that would give it is different. It's, and I call these breaks on structure. Uh, the structure of the bottom of the lake is no longer smooth, but the structure is a feature of the bottom that is different from the surrounding area. So the fish can see it. And this difference, this structure, this feature that is different must extend from the deep water all the way to the shallows. As the fish move on structure, they pause or stop at breaks on structure. Now what does this do to us? You and I can pause and stop at breaks in, on the structure. We can check them out. You say, well, uh, how are you going to there? Well, we're going we're gonna to have a tool in a minute to do that with, too. Six. Fish do not move constantly nor consistently. You and I have to exercise patience, controlled by the weather and the water conditions. And the weather and the water conditions will be changing all the time, even yearly, monthly, weekly, and daily. So you cannot, but you're going to have to check it out. 